The talk that I have for you today is from a new book project that I started working on a couple years ago and it's been what I've been working on um, while I've been spending the last uh, several months based at the Air and Space Museum in Washington DC. And the project kind of stemmed from a fellowship that I did uh, back in 2008, I was in the in France uh, for about four or five months, and it was one of these kind of weird fellowships where academics are there to write books and articles, but also there was a group of about four or five artists who were there, and I found myself while I was there spending more and more time hanging out with the artists and asking them questions, and I think that was in part um, probably because I was trying to avoid the work that I was actually supposed to be there to do, um, so it was kind of one way of setting that aside. But I think also because I understood what the academics were there doing, but I didn't really understand what the artists were doing. And I had a very naive understanding of how artists went about doing their work. And I just found the conversations I had with them to be very fascinating. Sort of the rigor at which they approached the work that they were doing, the questions that they were asking. And I think, as I think back about this project, that is in many ways where some of the ideas for it, or at least the interest in it, uh, came from. So anyway, to to do is take you back to 1960. It's St. Patrick's Day in New York City. It's a foggy, snowy, miserable, drizzly Manhattan day. And at the evening, um, that evening at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, a group of guests and reporters were standing around in puddles of cold slush, waiting to see a work of art destroy itself. The piece that they were there to see was called um, Homage uh, to New York. And once we get past this little clip of the artist talking about it, we'll see it actually in action. It was a piece that was uh, designed and made by the Swiss-born kinetic artist uh, Jean Tingeli. And where, ah, there we go. Where some people saw beauty in this ungainly work, less charitable observers uh, might have seen homage as the byproduct of an encounter between a hardware store and a New Jersey garbage dump. Uh, but after about an hour's delay, um, the artist managed to get the piece up and running, and this, if you were there, was what you would get to see. And we also see that it was represented, for example, on the cover of an engineering magazine nine years later, a magazine that was uh, specifically for electrical engineers. So the guests gathered there in the uh, uh, sort of courtyard garden at, the, uh, at MoMA to watch this piece come to life and stutter towards destruction. And this, again, short video gives some idea of the cacophony that uh, they were there to witness. And after the event ended in a very unceremonious fashion, the guests trickled out. Some of them grabbed pieces of the artwork and took it home as souvenirs. Um, critics roundly condemned the performance piece, whatever you want to call it, the next day. But the part that intrigues me most is that the artist didn't build this by himself. He had considerable aid from a man by the name of Billy Kluver, who was an engineer at Bell Labs. And Kluver, according to Life magazine, was the Edison, Tesla, Steinmetz, Marconi, Leonardo da Vinci of the American avant-garde, which, as you can tell, is quite a lot uh, to live up to. And for more than a decade, Kluver, organized and promoted art and technology collaborations through an organization that he helped start in New York City called Experiments in Art and Technology. And while critics saw homage, the piece that you just uh, saw the short video clip of, they saw it as this nihilistic expression about technology, Kluver took a different stance. As he wrote, in the same way as a scientific experiment can never fail, this experiment in art could never fail. In other words, what Kluver was saying is that to judge homage on the basis of whether it worked or not, or whether it was aesthetically successful, would be to miss the point. And this introduction, this description of this event at MoMA in 1960, was one of the opening salvos in what became known as the art and technology movement of the long 1960s. Just to give you an example of this, of some sense of the collaborative activity that marked this movement, here are some examples of what was happening in just one year, 1968. So the 
So here, for example, we see people from Kluver's nonprofit group, Experiments in Art and Technology. They organized lectures for artists that introduced them to new media, including lasers, computer graphics, electronic music, television, television, holography, as well as getting them to think about the science of perception and color. Or if we go an ocean away over to Paris, in what used to be the global center for modern art, we would find an American-born engineer turned artist named Frank Molina, one of the co-founders of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, who was presenting the first issue of a new journal made in the same mold of the scientific journals that he was familiar with. Leonardo presented articles by artists that described various aesthetic experiments that they were doing, including the use of new technologies, also while delving into issues of scientific and artistic creativity. Or if we bounce back to California, down in Los Angeles at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, it was deep into a five-year effort to forge creative interactions between artists, industry, and corporate engineers. This is a cover page on the left there of a report that LACMA issued in 1971, and this is sort of a montage of all the different companies that participated, everything from Ampex to Rockwell International to Kaiser in Industries and TRW, sort of a montage, if you will, of Southern California um, companies and contractors, well, California anyway. Or if we think about what was happening Again, back to experiments in art and technology, where Billy Kluver had negotiated with the Pepsi software company to build a multimedia pavilion for the 1970s World Fair in Osaka. And the result was a very elaborate and expensive multimedia environment that was experienced by tens of thousands of fair goers. So my point from these examples from 1968 is that something significant was happening in the creative world, something that was bringing engineers and artists together in all sorts of new ways. Now, of course, collaborations between individual artists and engineers have been going on for a long time. What marks the 1960s period and what I'm most interested in are the era's formal efforts, the projects, the major exhibitions, the new publishing ventures, and the new organizations that formed to promote and advocate for these collaborations between artists and engineers. Now, of course, compared to the better known social movements in the 1960s, art and technology was a movement very much with a small m. But its advocates shared similar goals. Likewise, art critics' harsh reactions to art and technology was conditioned by broader critiques of the Vietnam War, racism, and corporate power. And this is ironic because one of the main motivations for the, that art and technology advocates had in the first place was to humanize technology while offering alternative creative avenues for engineers. So, with the exception of some exploration by scholars of new media, this art and technology movement remains mostly a hidden history, at least if the art history canon is any guide. So, uh, you know, if you were to pick up a uh, standard textbook for a uh, you know, upper division uh, art history undergraduate class, you'd find, I'd be, I'd be surprised if you found any mention of these activities um, at all. And moreover, the scholars who have looked at this art and technology movement have tended to place their attention almost entirely on the artists. And this is partly because many of the artists who were involved with it were stars of the avant-garde art world. People like Andy Warhol and John Cage and Lucinda Childs and uh, Robert Rauschenberg, people like that. So as a result, the technologists who were essential to the movement were diminished to what Stephen Shapin in another context might have called invisible technicians. So while it I'm not interested in ignoring the artists wholeheartedly, but what I want to do in this new project, something that I'm calling re rewiring art, is to restore engineers and scientists more to the foreground. And I see this project partly as an experiment in writing the history of science. I think it's fairly safe to say that generally, historians of science have tended to import a lot of their ideas from other fields into our own work. Ideas like the sociology of knowledge, or trading zones, or lab studies that borrow a lot from anthropology, things like that. By looking at the art and technology movement, I think there's an opportunity to perhaps export some of our ideas, ideas about large-scale collaborations, the importance of new publishing ventures as catalysts for community formation, the importance of Cold War-derived technologies, and so forth, into um, you know, perhaps the art history community. Perhaps there's an opportunity here for some more fruitful interactions.
Now, obviously the words art and artist cover a huge amount of territory. My primary focus in this project is the visual arts. And this is largely out of necessity. I'm, I'm not an art historian, so one of the things I've been doing a lot in the last year is reading a lot of art history. And the idea that I would have to somehow include music and electronic sounds and stuff like that is a little bit daunting because that's a whole other body of literature that I have to, to learn. But there needs to be also a bit of realism here because much of the art and technology activity that was happening at this time produced works that were, in the language of the time, intermedia. So I'm not limiting myself solely to the visual, but that's kind of my primary starting point. And I'm also concentrating on formal efforts like um, experiments in art and technology for a reason. And this is primarily one of signal strength. In other words, this is where the most plentiful historical sources can be found. Engineers, as many of you might guess, are oftentimes silent in the historical record when um, you know, it comes to recording and documenting their experiences, and they're oftentimes especially silent in terms of their collaborations with artists. But the exception to this is that these large and formal projects like uh, LACMA's Art and Technology um, endeavor tend to be much better documented and this is where the strongest signal comes from and for my purposes this is the best opportunity to understand the activities and experiences of these techno aesthetic communities if we want to think of them that way. So before delving into two examples I wanted to spend a little bit of time just describing briefly what was happening within the engineering and artist communities in the 1960s. So one snapshot for example the engineering profession appeared in 1966. This was a new installment in the popular um, life science library that Time Life published. It was sort of you know aimed at uh, you know a layperson audience. It was one of those, you know, sort of books you would get like one a month, you know, probably for the low, low price of $2.99 or something like that. But it directed engineers to consider, um, it directed readers to consider engineers as the people who helped make modern America a prosperous, secure, and materially comfortable nation. This is the sort of thing that Matt Wisniewski has written about very, very nicely in his book, Engineers for Change. Now, there were many external signs of success that engineers were having. Uh, for example, the National Academy of Engineering was created in 1965. Yet many engineers in the 1960s felt a growing sense of insecurity as they were criticized by writers and intellectuals, people like Lewis Mumford, as the sort of docile servants of the military industrial complex. And these critiques of technology spilled over into debates about how the next generation of engineers should be educated. One of the things I'm interested in this project is looking for examples of um, connections and correlations between debates and discussions about engineering education and this idea that partnering and collaborating with artists was a way to sort of help humanize and improve engineering education. This is something I'll come back to at the uh, end of the talk here. Now obviously, as I mentioned, there's a very rich history here and as, as I said, uh, Matt's work is a really great uh, place to start here. But as these advertisements that I've shown here suggest, the idea was that it was possible in the mid-1960s to be both an engineer and not to be content with the status quo. You know, I love that picture of the uh, engineer there on the left setting the blueprints on fire. It looks like he's, you know, lighting a Molotov cocktail that he's, you know, just sort of ready to throw over the ramparts perhaps. But my main point here is that in response to these critiques about technology and engineer social responsibility, some engineers began to seek alternative forms of creativity and personal fulfillment. For example, engineers search for a more humanized technology might be found, for example, by collaborating with artists. As Billy Kluver told an audience in 1967, these personal interactions, this hands-on approach to creativity, was preferred to what he said, quote, reading articles about the two cultures on a Sunday afternoon and then just going back to the office as normal on Monday. Now, I chose that last quote very deliberately because 1960s discourse about engineer-artist collaborations was suffused with two cultures talk. Now, of course, you know, many of you understand that the history of the two cultures debate is very, very well-worn ground. And suffice it to say that the physicist turned novelist C.P. Snow originally tailored the force of his 1959 critique for specific Anglo-centric circumstances. But as Snow's ideas transmitted across the Atlantic, two cultures became a synecdoche for a more general diagnosis, that there was some deep divide between humanists and scientists. And in keeping with my electrical metaphors throughout this talk, I would suggest that the phrase served as an invisible yet pervasive influence on a lot of these art and technology collaborations. A field, if you will, that surrounded much of this discourse about 1960s art and technology. 
And I would also just put forth the other idea that for us today, two cultures is very much a cliche. I mean, it just is. Um, you know, just listen to academic administrators or provosts or whatever, obviously not at this school, but at other schools, you know, who will you know, bandy about that phrase as a way of sort of diagnosing some sort of general illness that exists within the system and it's something that needed, needs to be addressed and overcome. The point I'm trying to make in this project is that for engineers in 1965, it had yet to become a cliche, a stock phrase, something that had largely been drained of meaning. But for an engineer in 1965, discussing this two cultures divide was something that was very real and very important. I think it's kind of essential, at least for my own thinking of this project, to sort of go back to this time before two cultures had you know, become this you know, well-worn academic sort of cliche. Okay, so like engineers, artists also experienced the 1960s as this period of crisis and change. By 1960, the art world's center of gravity had shifted from Paris to New York, and meanwhile, movements like abstract expressionism, exemplified by people like Jackson Pollock and promoted by critics like Clement Greenberg as an exemplar of what was free, fresh, and powerful about post-American, uh, post-war American art, had largely run its course. Painters had begun to incorporate objects, sound, light, um, other effects into their works, making what Robert Rauschenberg, for example, called combines. Here's an example of a piece of his that incorporates uh, visual sculptural objects as well as sound uh, from 1959. And this challenge to traditional media, like painting, for example, was also reflected by the inclusion of the audience in much publicized multimedia environments known as happenings. So here's an example from a uh, 1962 happening in the East Village where if you, well, if this were bigger, you would perhaps recognize Andy Warhol uh, standing here, sort of observing uh, Klaus Oldenburg and some other people rolling around in what looks to be shaving cream or some sort of thing like that. It's Klaus Oldenburg there wearing the green pants. But the point is that these happenings were places where sound and dance blended with the visual arts. As artists challenged traditional uses of media, the door opened for those who wanted to experiment with and incorporate previously inaccessible technologies into their work. So one way we can get a sense of what artists were thinking about, um, for example, in 1967, the journal Art in America published results from a survey of artists that it did. And again, I won't, probably impossible to read from where you're sitting, but just to give you some sense of this, you know, drawing from this survey that was done of about 50 different artists, one of the things that emerges is that being an artist was becoming increasingly a credentialed profession as MFA degrees were becoming necessary for success in the art world. One artist noted in the survey how, quote, scientific jargon and space analogies were now part of everybody's toolkit. Like science, art was subject to media celebration and scrutiny. The art world had become increasingly preoccupied, artists noticed, with celebrity and fads as pop art, op art, and all of the other art world isms came and went with increasing frequency. One of the era's artistic innovators noted, for example, that the artist, with a capital A, was no longer a solitary, tortured soul, but a, quote, ordinary man of the world. Now, note how the observations like these resonate with Steve Shapin's recent observations in A Scientific Life about how science was increasingly transformed from a moral calling, say, in the 1920s, into a job after the Second World War. And art funding was also changing itself in dramatic ways. President Johnson, for example, created the National Endowment for the Arts in 1965, and corporate America helped fund increasingly elaborate exhibitions. With these sorts of examples, one of the things I'm interested in looking at, and I would gently argue, that there are some telling parallels between the professional worlds of the artists and the engineering communities. As an aside, I've also found some really fantastic um, cases where concepts from the history of science as it existed in 1965 were being drawn upon by art critics and art writers in their own work. So Thomas Kuhn, for example, not surprisingly with his talk about paradigms and revolutions, is language that you find increasingly being used by art critics and art writers at that time. So anyway, but that's sort of setting kind of the general contextual frame for it. What I'd like to do for the rest of my talk is focus on two people and their participation in this art and technology movement. So I've already introduced the first person, Billy Kluver. So let's um, come back to him. So Kluver was born in Sweden in 1927. 
And as a teen, he became very, very interested in experimental in foreign film, which remained very much a lifelong passion, if uh, not obsession for him. He did his undergraduate degree in Sweden, where he studied electronics, and uh, also became friends with a man by the name of Pontus Holton, who later directed the Pompidou Center in Paris, as well as Stockholm's Museum of uh, Modern Art. Kluver leaves Sweden in 1954, and he comes here, how appropriate, where he studies electrical engineering. He graduates from Berkeley in 1958, and a year later joins the Communication Science Division at Bell Labs. His specialty was microwaves and las uh, later uh, laser physics. And you know, he did work at Bell Labs, which uh, earned him several patents. And I don't need to remind this particular audience um, of why Kluver's location at Bell Labs was so important. As he notes in an interview, a few years before his death. At Bell Labs, Kluver had access to this amazing array of people, devices, and ideas, coupled with the freedom and financial resources to experiment. And we can think of Kluver geographically literally finding himself astride C.P. Snow's two cultures, with one foot in Murray Hill, New Jersey, in the technical world of Bell Labs, and the other foot in Lower Manhattan, Greenwich Village, art studios, museums, and galleries that he was so fond of. When Kluver first encountered C.P. Snow's Two Cultures lecture and then the book uh, right after they first appeared, he found the diagnosis very troubling. And he started to think about constructive ways to bridge the gaps that Snow had identified. For example, he proposed that Bell Labs start and fund an art and science club for its employees, sort of a way of bringing different communities together. And Kluver, surprisingly somewhat for an engineer, did a huge amount of writing. And one of the reasons I find him so interesting is that his uh, widow has, um, you know, there's a very nice collection of his writings that she's managed to preserve and save. And he wrote all sorts of um, published essays, both both in um, American publications, but also in publications in Europe. And some of these were articles about the New York art scene, so I find this kind of remarkable that you have this Bell Labs engineer who's writing pieces for art magazines about kind of what's cool and hip and happening in uh, downtown Manhattan. But he also wrote several essays about technology and society, which to my eyes are very much kind of like proto-STS pieces. You know, thinking about social responsibility, kind of like that flavor of STS that existed in the late 1960s, um, early 1970s, sort of a proto-Langdon winner approach perhaps we could think of. And Kluver and his writings oftentimes turn to analogy to describe this relationship as he imagined it between artists and engineers. For example, he wrote that technology, again with a capital T as he writes it out, was like a, quote, enormous fortified castle. Artists wanted, he imagined, to get inside that castle. They wanted to have access to the goodies that were inside there. And technology, Kluver imagined for artists, represented the future. But how could this infiltration begin? And Kluver argued in several essays that this interface would happen when artists began to fraternize with what he called, quote, the soldiers on the castle walls. In other words, by collaborating with the engineers. And he imagined that this was a way for artists to get inside this space and to expand their scope of activity, expand their creative horizons, and to find a new community of individuals to interact with. So, the piece that I started by talking, uh, started uh, my presentation talking about, homage to New York, very much marked the start of Kluver's personal collaborations with artists. And he continued this via uh, collaborations with Robert Rauschenberg, here shown working on a piece in the early 1960s. He collaborated with Jasper Johns and Andy Warhol, dancers like uh, Yvonne Rayner and uh, Lucinda Childs. He himself took part in happenings, so you can sort of imagine this, you know, button-down Bell Labs engineer setting aside, you know, the white shirt that he wore every day and, you know, going to uh, galleries and shows in Greenwich Village and actually participating in some of those happenings that I talked about here. And in 1965, Kluver began to collaborate with colleagues back in his native Sweden for an art and technology festival. Plans for this fell apart, however, and the venue instead shifted to New York City. In fact, it shifted to New York City's uh, 69th Regiment Armory, which, for those of you who are familiar with art history, in 1913 had hosted a path-breaking display of modern art for American audiences. And the result of this project was a uh, series of shows 
called Nine Evenings, Theater and Engineering, done over nine evenings. And as far as art and technology events go, it's probably the most widely written about by new media scholars. But again, the focus has largely been on the artists and their performances. So for example, here is uh, artist Alex Hay, image of him projected in the background there. This is Robert Rauschenberg doing something with some flags. But the thing that was interesting is that um, a group of engineers at Bell Lab had wired microphones, um, wireless microphones to uh, the artist, and it transmitted, transmitted the sounds of his body, his breathing, his heartbeat, whatever, into the speaker system uh, that was in the, uh, in the armory here. Uh, by and large, um, critics' reaction to Nine Evenings was very hostile. Um, this is despite the fact that more than two dozen engineers from Bell Labs took part in these collaborations with the artists that were involved and contributed literally thousands of hours of unpaid labor to it. Without them, there simply would have been no show. Um, expectations on the part of the audience were very unrealistic. The uh, uh, group putting together the show had hired a uh, high-powered uh, New York public relations firm to promote it. And I think it's fair to say that they went a little beyond promoting it and sort of promised the audience that they would see you know, these sort of fantastical displays of you know, people flying through the air and sort of you know, kind of an unrealistic expectation of what art and uh, technology and science could actually do. But as I said, critics' reaction was very, very hostile to the show. One New York critic after attending the first night concluded, quote, God bless American art, but God help American science. And this is in large part because the Performances that were put on were very, very technically demanding, and quite simply, the engineers hadn't had sufficient time to work out the bugs from the show. So a lot of the performances, you know, they had lots of delays, they had a lot of technical glitches, and they didn't really work particularly well. Kluver himself puckishly noted that the best reviews that the Nine Evening Show received were in the Wall Street Journal. So he felt that there was some thing here that was happening that art critics were missing and that it was really in uh, sort of the bastions of corporate art um, or excuse me, corporate America that um, these art and technology collaborations would find their home. So the critics focus primarily on the aesthetic quality of the art that came out of these collaborations. But as Kluver and other art and technology advocates insisted, the novelty wasn't supposed to be the product, but rather the collaborative process. As the name of Kluver's organization that he eventually formed states, these truly were to be experiments in art and technology. And this was certainly how the engineers who volunteered for Nine Evenings saw them. As one of Kluver's Bell, Lab, Bell Labs colleagues told him, the whole thing was, quote, an experiment of uncertain income, um, excuse me, outcome, <laughs> a realm of activity familiar to both artists and engineers. The show united people who, quote, believed it was time to prove C.P. Snow wrong. And in, the, in this goal, the engineers as well as the artists believe that they had succeeded. So again, you have sort of this varying sense of what it meant to succeed. You know, there's success, of course, for an art critic or an art writer versus that for an artist versus that for an engineer who's helping these things along. In the midst of organizing nine evenings, uh, Kluver, along with another engineer at Bell Labs by the name of Fred Waldhauer, and artists uh, Bob Whitman and Robert Rauschenberg, uh, first put together the uh, formal legal foundation for what became experiments in art and technology. And over the next several months, Kluver and his colleagues worked out the organization's goals before having their official coming out party in October 1967. This got very prominent coverage in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and indicative of the kind of partnerships that Kluver wanted to make in the pages of labor magazines like the AFL-CIO News. It's very hard to see here, but this is a picture of a very stout labor union looking guy here. Um, it says organized labor on his sleeve and it says union supported arts. So again, Kluver imagined that this was not only a way of bridging the worlds of artists and engineers, but perhaps these collaborations might be a way also to bridge the divide between labor and management. So this drawing here on the left by Billy Kluver a cartoon, really, suggests his visions for how art and technology collaborations could foster reconciliations. Kluver's strategy for forming this new creative culture can certainly contain some utopian aspects that resonated with the uh, 
era's other ambitious social movements. For example, consider the long-range goals that EAT uh, published here. This is, a, very, again, a very hard to see, but it's sort of this white and blue cloud background. It was a graphic designed by Robert Rauschenberg, and Kluver and Rauschenberg uh, together wrote out this sort of set of three goals for uh, EAT. For example, they believe that as a trusted intermediary, Experiments in art and technology would help broker, quote, civilized collaborations between technology and the arts. Second, that this would help individuals feel less isolated from and less anxious about technological change by encouraging individual exploration and involvement. Finally, industry, the arts, and engineering would help foster mutual understanding via cooperative projects, something as Rauschenberg evocatively put it at the end of the statement, something that was necessary and needed to avoid the waste of a cultural revolution. So there was a sense that something really profound and powerful was happening in the mid-1960s, and EAT was going to be part of that and indeed help foster these social changes. So again, this wasn't really just about art in and of itself. That there was sort of a broader program of social um, action here that they were um, imagining. So throughout its lifetime, Kluver maintained that um, EAT's focus would be on building these collaborations. And it wasn't going to be about judging aesthetics. The American Physical Society, he said once, quote, admits all papers to its conferences. We never hear about bad scientists the way we hear about bad artists. So I think statements like this help reveal Kluver's search for a certain kind of symmetry in terms of how these experiments in research and experiments in art might be evaluated. So as you can tell, I'm really excited about um, EAT's story, about its history, and in part it's because the documentation for it is so rich. The collection for it is, uh, the, the entire collection is um, at the Getty Research Institute down in Los Angeles, and it's something like 250 boxes of documents. I mean, it's both a fantastically rich set of documents as well as a very daunting set of documents to go through. I've just been slowly kind of chipping away at it. But like I said, the signal strength there is very, very strong. There are many, many, many uh, written recollections um, and reports from the engineers and scientists who participated in EAT on what they wanted to do, what they got out of it, why they participated in it in the first place. And again, it's not that I'm so much interested in just completely sidelining the artists, but I think this offers a really nice way to get the perspective from another community that was so central to these art and technology collaborations. Okay. So with that, I'd like to turn away from the ways in which infrastructure to support the art and technology movement was built and shift to thinking about the technologies artists wanted to use. For example, let's consider the laser. The first optical laser was announced in mid-1960, and as this advertisement from 1962 says, you know, where does the laser go from here? One of the places that the laser went, one of the places that it migrated to, was artists' studios, art galleries, and eventually museums. So, for example, in Washington, D.C., an up-and-coming artist by the name of Rockne Krebs began using lasers to create sculptural works. This piece that he's shown here with in a newspaper photograph is called Sculpture Minus Object. It was a piece that Krebs made in collaboration with a physicist from the University of Maryland. And it became the first in a series of increasingly ambitious works that Krebs made, sometimes done in collaboration with uh, engineers. Now, these explorations of the laser's creative potential wasn't limited to just artists. And the art and technology movement included many scientists and engineers whose activities oscillated between their research careers and their aesthetic pursuits. So we might, for example, consider the experience of Elsa Garmeyer. Born in 1939, she studied physics at Harvard, and then in 1961 moved to MIT for her doctoral studies. Charlie Towns, one of the Lasers co-inventors, became her graduate advisor, and after finishing her degree at MIT, she moved to Pasadena, California, and took a postdoc position at Caltech. Like Billy Kluver, her research specialty was laser physics. And when she arrived at Caltech, as you can imagine, lasers were still relatively expensive, delicate devices that required experts to build and operate. Now, Garmeyer, again, as many of you can imagine at the time, found Caltech to be an unwelcoming environment for a woman scientist. And as she began to sort of navigate 
that particular um, institutional environment, she also began to consider alternate, um, alternative career paths. Now, as part of its expansion in the mid to late 1960s, EAT had several local chapters, and one of its most active chapters was in Los Angeles. And after attending an early organizing meeting in July 1968, Garmer gets in touch with Billy Kluver and expresses her interest in uh, further thinking about technology as a medium of expression. Technolo uh, Kluver was very impressed by her um, research credentials, you know, degrees with Charlie Towns, you know, Harvard, MIT, etc. Invited her to participate in a panel on art and science at the uh, AAAS. And eventually over the next several months, Garmeyer becomes increasingly involved in EAT's West Coast activities. For example, Garmeyer contributed in a significant ways to EAT's biggest project, which I mentioned earlier. This was the design and building of this multimedia pavilion for the Pepsi Corporation. EAT was hired in 1968, and over the next two years, Kluver and his group worked frantically to design and equip the pavilion. The total cost was somewhere in the neighborhood of about $1.3 million, which if you translate that to today's money, is about $9 million. One could make the argument that the Pepsi Pavilion was the 20th century's most elaborate and expensive art project. And Garmeyer was one of the dozens of artists and engineers who traveled between the United States and Japan um, to do what I guess we could think of as maybe the, um, the art world's version of big science, if you will. So this is an exterior view of the pavilion. If you were a visitor here, you would enter through this tube. You would receive these uh, wireless handsets. You would literally be bathed in laser light. They weren't terribly worried about the... Yeah, anyway. Um, you'd be bathed in laser light. These are movable kind of cybernetic floats that uh, moved around very, very slowly, and they were meant to imitate the uh, stones in Japanese uh, Zen gardens, sort of this kind of moving slowly around, and they would kind of move towards people and then move away from them based on the sounds that they were saying. This whole thing is shrouded in a fog sculpture that was a collaborative effort between a Japanese artist by the name of Fujiko Nakaya and a Pasadena-based physicist named Thomas Mee. And they developed a very innovative um, system which they patented to literally create fog sculptures. Have any of you ever been to the new Exploratorium? There's a fog bridge um, that's outside there. That is also Fujika Nakaya's work, also done in collaboration with uh, the Mee Industries Corporation. So anyway, this is the sort of um, large-scale multimedia environment that uh, Garmeyer found herself working on. But as she engaged more and more with the art world, she began to reflect upon this relationship between technology and society. And again, these are just some excerpts from a short essay she wrote and published in 1970. As she said, well, technology defined modern life. The technologists, she said, were, quote, incapable of relating to the machines that they built. Instead, she thought it was artists who would be best equipped to, quote, approach and interpret technology. And the art that they would make, Garmeyer said, is the, quote, first step towards eliminating this divinity of technological wonders. And again, one of the things that I find really fascinating in this, uh, as well as um, Kluver's essays, again, is sort of the way they anticipated some of the critiques and reflections that would go on to become part of the STS literature of the 1970s. So this process through which art is made, Garmeyer noted, is oftentimes irrelevant to the original purpose of the device that makes it. And her own experiments with lasers for artistic purposes extended this idea into practice. Initially, Garmeyer created what she called lasergrams. These were photographs of images made by shining laser lights through diffraction media and then photographing the results that were uh, produced. But Garmeyer also recognized that Lasers could be used in a more dynamic way. So, for example, in celebration of the July 1969 moon landing, she created a laser wall sculpture um, around the Caltech campus. And here are some people, again, sort of oblivious to the potential of being blinded by it, um, kind of walking around and, and, and experiencing um, it. Garmeyer's live laser works uh, caught the attention of a man by the name of Ivan Dreyer who worked in the Los Angeles film industry, but also had connections with Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. And after seeing a presentation of Garmeyer's work, Dreyer and a colleague visited her at her Caltech lab and filmed the shapes and forms that her laser systems generated. 
But Dreyer soon realized that filming Garmeyer's laser images was aesthetically inferior to seeing the intensity and purity of their colors in person. So Dreyer and Garmeyer went on to start a company that they called Laser Images Incorporated, and riffing on the popularity of planetarium shows, they called it Laserium, which I suspect many of you have heard of. So just as planetarium shows helped popularize astronomy in the 20th century, we can think of Laserium as a public display of laser technology at a time when most typical people hadn't ever seen a laser in real life. This was sort of a chance to see a new sort of cutting edge technology and see it in a somewhat unconventional uh, format. So I can think of Laserium as sort of akin to those 19th century displays of electricity and electrical effects, sort of a ancestor of it, if you will. Unconventional to be sure, Laserium certainly had some aesthetic admirers. One art writer, for example, referred to experiments with laser projection as, quote, the seeds of what will become the high universally acclaimed visual art of the future. Now, of course, given Laserium's penchant for attracting attendees whose appreciation of choreographed laser light was chemically enhanced, high visual art assumes another meaning as well. <laughs> Any case. Around 1974, Garmeyer begins shifting her creative energies back to science. She gives up the company that she and uh, Dreyer had helped start. She eventually leaves Caltech and goes on to have an amazingly successful scientific career, first at the University of Southern California and then at Dartmouth College, where she eventually becomes the Dean of Engineering and President of the Optical Society of America. Meanwhile, Laserium goes on to become, you know, judging from the giggles and titters that I'm hearing, a uh, understood and familiar part of American uh, pop culture as millions of people over the 20, 30 plus years of Laserium's lifetime turned out to see these multicolored laser light shows set to music, a somewhat aesthetic art form, I suppose, that you know, has its origins back in this art and technology movement from the late 1960s. Okay, moving to my conclusion. So at the start of my talk, I said I was interested in the ways in which the histories of art and the histories of science and technology might become more closely aligned. One connection I think could be found by looking at the reactions that people had to these art and engineer collaborations. And I think there are some parallels to how historians of science, people like Bill Leslie or Paul Foreman, have examined the effect of Cold War patronage on knowledge production. Although there were exceptions, by and large, the reaction of art critics and other observers of the cultural scene was largely negative. And there were two basic reasons. First, there was the charge that they made that by collaborating with engineers, artists had compromised themselves aesthetically. The integration of new technology, whether it was lasers, digital computers, electric lights, electric sounds, oftentimes challenged and confounded critics. As Barbara Rose, and she was one of the critics who was actually fairly sympathetic to the aims of EAT, she said it was hard to differentiate the outcomes from multimedia art exhibits from discotheques or other commercial entertainment. They were, she said, oftentimes, or too often, electric without offering electricity. So here, for example, is a piece, of, an, uh, piece uh, of art that was especially attacked by critics in the early 1970s. This is Robert Rauschenberg's piece, Mud Muse, which was made for a 1971 show um, at LACMA. It was a cybernetic mud bath that was made to bubble in response to the ambient sounds in the gallery. So as people walked around and talked or sneezed or whatever, you know, little blip, blip, blip would bubble up through, uh, through the mud. Um, uh, it was a, as one artist sniffed, a glorified music box. But the point was that it was a collaborative work that Rauschenberg did in collaboration with uh, engineers from the uh, defense contractor Teledyne. And um, for him, it represented sort of the combination of, you know, cybernetic art, sort of coupled with, um, you know, sort of a proto-environmental uh, art um, as well. Another and more serious charge that critics made was that artists had also compromised themselves ethically, especially in collaborating with engineers, using military-derived technology, and accepting corporate patronage. Artists were, quote, as one critic said, con men, wannabe scientists, freeloaders at the trough of techno-fascism that had inspired them. Tied to this, though, were critiques about the technology itself. As sculptor Richard Serra said in 1971, technology was, quote, hope and hoax. 
It is what we do to the Black Panthers and the Vietnamese under the guise of advancement. Now it's clear by this point with statements like this that discussing art and technology wasn't really just talking about the value of the art itself anymore. And the harsh reactions in some quarters towards art and technology was also, I think, in part about cultural arbitration. Who had the power and position to call something art? What did it mean when an engineer like Billy Kluver could muster the resources, in his case literally tens of thousands of dollars from corporations, the NEA, the New York um, Council of the Arts, and become himself a source of aesthetic influence, a cultural broker? And as engineers and scientists were starting to have their own artwork shown in galleries and museums, how could a conflict not result? So maybe actors like art magazines and critics had a stake in maintaining this two cultures divide. I don't have any proof of this, but I think it's interesting to speculate. And anyway, this initial wave of enthusiasm for art and technology by the early 1970s had waned. By the mid-1970s, these large-scale collaborations between artists and engineers appeared as out of fashion as Apollo moon landings. So to wrap this up, three thoughts. First of all, I'd like to question the judgment that the art and technology movement itself was a failure. Drawing upon our experiences as historians of science, what if we think of artists' early attempts to use new technology as akin to a researcher's early initial theory? So maybe it's akin to Niels Bohr's first primitive model of the hydrogen atom. Sure, it was limited in terms of what it, it could explain, but it was a starting point. It was a starting point for future research. It was something to build upon. So I'm inclined to think, at least at this point of the project, to think about artists halting an experimental engagement with engineers in the same symmetry that we treat scientific knowledge. Critics' judgment arrived before the real potential, I think, could be shown. I think we also have to question the meaning of failure. Billy Kluver imagined EAT as having very much a finite lifespan. Ultimately, he predicted industry, universities, and professional societies would take EAT's place. And while this didn't unfold how Kluver had imagined, there's no denying that it did happen. One of the things that really got me interested in this project also was just looking around all the different Research One campuses across the country and then into Europe and seeing how many of them had some sort of program, center, institute devoted to this nexus of art and design and engineering, art and technology, science and art. The last time I counted, there were something like 40 separate centers and programs, some degree granting, within the United States alone. Within the UC system, eight of the 10 campuses have some sort of art and technology or art and engineering program or center or whatever. At my home department, our home university, uh, UCSB, there's a media arts and technology program. UCLA, I think, has two of these uh, sort of entities. I don't know what the name of the Berkeley one is, but I know there's definitely one here. The point is that this idea that Kluver had that other institutions institutions would take over for um, EAT did eventually come to pass. And if one looks also at this interest of art and technology, I think we can see how it comes in waves. The 1960s left behind sort of a wave that came in and left behind this infrastructure for collaboration and publishing at this art technology nexus. Jump ahead to the 1990s, you have, for example, at Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center, a very prominent, although short-lived, artist in residence program. And today, if you go down to LACMA, you find that they have rebooted their art and technology program. They now call it the Art and Technology Lab. And what I find fascinating about it is if you look at the companies that are involved, it's this wonderful map, if you will, of the way Los Angeles industry has evolved over time. So gone, of course, are North American Aviation and Rockwell and Teledyne, Death Incorporated, or whatever. And it's been replaced by Google, SpaceX, some big data firms, some biotech firms, and whatever. So, I mean, clearly there's this cultural capital um, coupled with real capital that is being expended. If we think about some of the other factors, maybe these surges or waves of art and technology happen when there is debate happening about engineering education. I think today we can sort of look at discussions about the STEM to STEAM movement. Now, of course, correlation isn't causation, but just last week I spent an afternoon with some people at the National Academy of Sciences who are getting ready to gear the academy up for some sort of STEM to STEAM report that they're putting uh, together. So this idea of adding the arts and humanities into uh, STEM education, you know, is there a connection between that and these uh, waves of interest in um, art and technology? Finally, to conclude, this history 
I hope, can remind us that things like art and technology are not static category. Uh, static categories, but rather they're cultural enterprises. And if we look at these successive ways of enthusiasm for art and technology, I think it can reveal some of these shifting relationships between art and technology and their connections with corporations, the art world, and the public. Ultimately, this is about how engineers, as well as artists, presented their expertise and creativity. One of the ways they did this was by rewiring art working together. And one outcome of this was a new creative culture. So thank you very much.